Welcome to the How Smart Teams Work webinar, Design Plus Production Proofing in One Place, hosted by Rackamy. Over the next 45 minutes, you'll hear from our EVP of Sales and Marketing, Matt Mahoney, Sales and Marketing Strategist and President of Hierarch Strategies, Lois Rita Rossi, and the President of the Berkshire Company, Mark Fallon. In this webinar, you, you learn about proofing horror stories from experienced professionals and how to avoid them how to accelerate, re, accelerate your review and approval process with use cases, how to share any type of creative and transactional document for fast, accurate feedback, what an efficient proving workflow process looks like with a live demonstration of Alchemy Proof, and how to easily achieve transactional document and marketing compliance on production and creative work. Because let's face it, working smarter, not harder, has never been more crucial in our hectic deadline-driven schedules. The agenda will look something like this. So we'll kick it off with industry leaders, Mark Fallon and Lois Rita Rossi as they talk to us about the history of proofing and then show us a real life scenario that they've been through of a bad proofing process. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll then transition to Matt who will show us what an efficient proofing workflow process looks like followed by a demonstration of Alchemy Proof. We will end the webinar with a short Q&A session, so make sure you add your questions in the questions section of the control panel on the bottom right side of your screen. We are recording this webinar, so don't worry. We'll make sure all attendees receive the video recording in the next couple of days. I think we can start now, so Lois and Mark, welcome. So thank you, and uh, we appreciate this time to, to talk with you. Lois and I are going to share some of our past history uh, about proofing and then even share a demo as was talked about. Uh, Lois, are you ready to start? Yes. Um, we look forward to talking about this very important to topic of proofing. But Mark, um, I know that you and I have both seen proofing evolve over the years. Um, Let's start with why is proofing so important, whether either direct marketing, commercial print, or transactional print? Why is it so important? Well, I think what's really important for people to remember, I mean, we live in the world of autocorrect. So people think, well, or I hit spell check, so therefore it's right. Well, if you use the word for, F-O-U-R, in place of for, F-O-R, Microsoft doesn't catch that. Spell check doesn't catch that because it's a right word. And when we talk about real life examples, we have seen that specific example. And there were other things because now we're using mostly graphics. So it may look like text, but it's actually graphics. And if you have, let's say for example, two for one, but somebody misinterprets that and has a dollar sign in front of the one, now you have two for $1. And again, that's not a made up scenario. I've seen it and I've seen the piece go out with that. So you wanna make sure you have a clear proofing process in place that makes sure the words are correct, the offer is correct, and that it's compliant with all legal and corporate standards. But let's talk a little bit about the history because earlier in my career in the 80s, proofing was very different when we primarily were working with offset presses, traditional large printing devices um, and several rounds of proofing. I used to have to proof on a blue line. I bet there's people here who don't know what blue lines are, Mark. I know you That's have history. That's right. Buff. So for those of you who don't know, a blue line was we would lay out print on what looked like, I'd call it, say, graph paper, if you know what a quadrille graph paper looks like with blue lines because the cameras would would fade that out and we would have to lay that out and then using grease pencils mark that up and then potentially have to lay it out all over again then a person and we found out our host matt was one of those people who used a real film-based camera to take a photo of that and then the negative went over to pressmen or pre-pressmen who would have to transfer that mechanically to a plate, then run a sample. And then by the way, the process starts all over again. We had to proof from physical documents and then pass that around and then edit it and pass it around again. Now that was, that was the eighties. And then in the nineties, uh, these three letters came up that are now 
we think of it as just something that's there and it's called PDF. And then we started to be able to have the digital proofs. And we also had email, right? Now email, again, a lot of us think email has been around forever. It hasn't, right? And we could send files and PDFs back and forth by email. And at the same time, we were able to move from that taking camera shots and then creating a plate and then taking a sample to direct to plate, right? We could use the digital image and go direct to plate. But you know what the proofing process still was at the end? Manual, because <laughs> someone would have to set up that offset press, make sure the colors are right, and then send a sample back, which would get marked up and then get sent out again. Then Mark, I used to have to go on real press checks on second and third shift whenever my job was running, because in addition to approving that brew line, I still would go on a press check if there were author's alterations or changes after blue lines. See, and you were the CSRs that people might, like me love to have, because I didn't have to go on third shift because you were doing that for me. But I was waiting for that email from you to say that you had checked it out. And, you know, we... We still were relying on email and we were still relying on physical proofs. Then in the late 90s, early 2000s, we got digital asset management where you could check something in and check something out. But we still had a problem. Which version were we looking at? Right now, if you were really good and there are some people I know who are on this call who were really good and they had very good naming conventions and processes. However, you're the exception and not the rule. And people, even if they were really good, could make mistakes. So version control and email uh, just exacerbated the whole situation because there were just more and more. So Mark, let, let's walk through a real example of some of the challenges of proofing. So what I'm showing today on this screen is a mock-up of a postcard. If we were doing a lead generation or an acquisition direct mail program, we might want to sit down and have a planning session, and then we might have proof approval. And if you were my client and I was collaborating with you, I would often put together a mock-up and I would say, Mark, what do you think of this headline? We make operations work as, as you know, from a consulting perspective. And then I might show you, there's a different example of it. We can change the colors. We can change the way the logo looks. Um, what are some of the questions that you might have if you were looking at this to approve it as that final approver? So, so the very first thing is that you and I see colors differently. And we've had this conversation, right? We're, we're really good business partners, folks, but the way Lois describes colors, the way I describe colors uh, are two different things. Like I think I have on a red tie and she has a red jacket. And Lois, what color is your jacket? It's a little more cranberry than red. See, it's cranberry, which is just red, folks, right? So. <laughs> But again, what is that color different? So that's, that's and by the way, these are not minor things. We, this is a real example of a postcard from a designer that we've been looking at. So where, where is the difference? And then the other part is, how do I describe which one I'm looking at? Or how do I document, right? This is the key part. How do I document which version I like, which version I don't like, and I guess, how do I recommend changes, Lois, right? That's that's the next part. And we have a third partner. Where where does she come in in all this? Does she get to approve after me, before me, during me? So, and what I've seen is in this example, so uh, Mark could be the marketing person. Mark could be approving for branding and colors, but Wendy, my colleague, might be the product person, and she might be approving for content or versions, like the headline in the actual text. Um, and what we've seen as people have implemented digital asset management systems and collaboration tools like Teams and others, sometimes you have creative people working in one tool, perhaps InDesign. Legal and compliance certainly don't work in InDesign. And then how do we get the series of approvals that are needed? Someone might be approving for legal, someone might be approving for compliance, someone might be approving for branding, and someone might be approving for variable data for versioning and segmentation. So this whole process can become more complicated, um, even with good collaboration tools. And it can be very challenging um, based on version control and tracking to know who has the final say and does somebody's comment supersede comments that came previously. And annotating PDFs, even if you're talented, 
and you get those little yellow post-it notes and you have to open them up on your screens um, can also become um, very challenging in missing a copy edit or missing a post-it note that is an annotated PDF. And, and the other part is, you know, you just described a really good workflow, but you have to have really good people who are going to follow that workflow, right? That is the part. How do we make sure? And, and again, I like people, I'm a person, but how do we make sure that people are following the process? Because, you know, too many times I've seen something like this. Okay, now this looks good, but after we've made the change, did we go back and get approval from branding, right? I spent a lot of money to have somebody come up with the, this, these color tones. And again, I didn't know this was cranberry or her, or her, her jacket was cranberry. My designer knows, right? So if I approve something that's not right, does it go back and still make sure that it's design proof? So having a good workflow is important, like Lois said, but how do we ensure that the workflow is being followed, right? That, that's the key part. And then you mentioned compliance, Lois, just a few minutes ago. Yeah, and compliance is critically important. So many people that we know work in highly regulated industries, banking, insurance, and healthcare. And this is an example of a postcard. And yes, I did download and start with a template from the Canva tool, which many people use. And lo and behold, as a person in the mailing industry, the first piece of compliance would be Mark's favorite topic, postal compliance. So Mark, Tell us a little bit about design and postal compliance in clear zones that the United States Postal Service demands for it to send something like a postcard through the mail. Right, so part of our branding is having a rectangle in the lower right-hand corner. And you know, hopefully all of you know, hopefully all of you know, that the Postal Service, that's where they put, especially on a postcard, the intelligent mail barcode. So you have to have, right, four and a half inches from that edge. Four and a half inches, folks, right? That's a lot of space that you can't use. And again, when we talk about compliance, yes, there's legal. Yes, there's the healthcare folks, right? Regulatory, the whole bit, the design. But there are postal regulations. And who is making sure that you're current those? And I, and I look at the shape. Now, it looks correct to me, but is it the right shape for a postcard is it the right size for a postcard postcard size has changed in 2021 so are we taking advantage of that are we using it appropriately what's the aspect ratio what is aspect ratio right you you need to know that to ask that question so again how do we know that it was looked at appropriately um, we have worked with folks i i got a text on a saturday afternoon we think our envelopes are out of compliance saturday afternoon and and somebody who when they laid it out didn't check for that and it was a you know business reply mail and the barcode was was it in or out of the clear zone right it was a really um i had you know they had to send me a proof we had to still print it out because they had to measure it right all of those things so electronic proofing is good but somebody didn't check along the way and so this can really set you back no and mark in today's world uh, th there's more content creators and there's people that are creating content for print for documents and for mailings as we know and love but those same people are also creating content that's only going to be delivered digitally in an html or pdf type of format and that further exacerbates the proofing process um, because how we deliver digital documents or digital content may be different in terms of all of those things that you said logos branding messaging formats and fonts so we've raised all the challenges. We know that Rackamy is going to uh, show us an amazing demonstration of, of the new platform and what it can do to resolve and really streamline this process. Matt, tell us a little bit more about the tool and uh, we'd love to see how it works. You are muted, my um, friend. Oh, can you guys hear me? Okay, so um, for those of you that don't know, uh, they mentioned blue line. This is what a blue line looks like. Uh, it was basically a reverse uh, print, but um, it, it's important to know this because we've we've gone through this whole thing of um, 
you know, how proofs were created from physical pieces that were sent to people, it went to fax, it went to email with PDF. And uh, today where we're going, really everybody's going towards these, uh, these sort of centralized proofing systems because email is a, a decentralized way to um, send somebody a proof. There's no real control over it. Um, if a designer is involved in a lot of projects, then um, it's hard to keep track of them. The people that are reviewing really can only review through an email, so they have to keep track of their emails. And um, you know, it's not like this one place where everybody can go. But anyway, just thought I would show that, uh, that blue line there. So uh, proofing is, is a little bit complicated. There's actually seven stages of, of content lifecycle, we'll call it, the things that you go through to create content from planning to creating the content. This would be where like a graphic designer is and number two, um, the storage of the assets and the things that are created and uh, organizing all of that with different versions and so on, version control. Uh, Mark touched on digital asset management, might go in there. You've got uh, editing and approving. Uh, you can put reviewing in here too. So a lot of people call that reviewing. If you're reviewing you know, marketing content or something that, um, you know, a banner ad or whatever it might be, a magazine, then uh, there's a lot of reviewing as a term that's common there. The publishing and distribution is where production falls in. So everything to, uh, you know, up to number four is sort of uh, pre-production and uh, creative design and so forth, the layouts. And then you get into, you know, the actual creation of, of either a hard copy or digital piece that is going to be uh, produced and, and distributed in some way. And then uh, six and seven have a lot to do with just reporting on that. So some content that's created is uh, meant for, for business purposes like marketing, and you want to measure, you know, does a certain creative have a better pull than another creative design? Or um, you know, are the assets that maybe we're sending emails and we need to make sure that uh, we store those emails and we have some history of that. So there's there's a lot of things that go on here. The the reason I show you this is because the product I'm going to show you, Alchemy Proof, um, falls in a couple of different areas on this uh, life cycle. So just want to make sure that everybody understands where that fits. And before I get there, just to give you an example of how um, the email thing works, the, uh, the and the problems with it. That really, um, this this thing of reviewing and approving and and collaboration is a problem of communication. Uh, largely, it's a problem of communication. Because once the design is created and somebody has to tell the designer, hey, this is what I have in my head and what I want you to, to create out of nothing, um, then you know that, that whole process is, is uh, communication with the designer and the business person who wants that content. And then, uh, the, then there's the, the email that goes to a person, if we're talking about email, because that's a pretty common way to do it today, to that reviewer. And for a simple piece, maybe that postcard that Lois was showing, Lois and Mark, uh, maybe they had 10 emails that went back and forth with the designer, changed this color to red, <laughs> and uh, you know whatever else. So, um, and then if you go to a different scenario where you have multiple reviewers on the center of the screen there, then you're going to have more emails. There's more people involved. Uh, maybe it's twice as many emails going back and forth between the graphic designers and the reviewers, and maybe even between the reviewers. So, you know, the, the graphic designer might not even be aware of those communications that are going on between the reviewers because they're having that discussion amongst themselves. And then uh, the last one here is um, a situation where you may have three different projects at the same time. So the graphic designer is working with a reviewer A, B, and C, but they're, they're not related to each other. They have their own projects. One's a website, one's a postcard, and one is, you know, a brochure. And, and now we're talking about a lot more emails. So the the more work that a graphic designer is involved in, the more projects they have, the more reviewers involved. Uh, and with these projects, a lot of times it's compliance and you've got legal and, and other departments that need to touch this, then uh, the communications really explode. And it's hard to keep track all that, of all that. And as, as Mark said, the workflow is important because if a change gets made in any one of these emails and the, the designer misses that email or misinterprets it or whatever, then, uh, or, or maybe they didn't even send the email, but they thought they did, then you could end up in a production mode where you're sending 10,000 emails or printing 
you know, uh, 5,000 books or whatever it is, and the, the content is, is not right. And now you've got yourself a, a costly situation. Okay, so uh, let's just walk through the, the life cycle a little bit. Uh, I put a few things on here. I'm just gonna pull them off so we can put them on and I can talk about the discussion. But basically, uh, when you're looking at this life cycle, so you got planning, creating, storing, organizing. These are the things I had on that previous slide. Uh, this is all the, the prep work, the design, the creative. And then over here, you have the physical production and the digital production for things like uh, documents, signs, labels, packages, books, you know, whatever it is there. And then here you have web pages, blogs, videos, personalized email, uh, those kinds of things. So uh, you can just envision the type of stuff that you guys are involved in. And if we use this example of using InDesign for the creation, of a, a postcard, we'll just use that as an example. Then uh, once that's created, the uh, designer would probably email it, right? Or find some way to get it over here to the editing and approving stage because they're looking for approval. They want the fastest path to get approval so they could move on to the next job or you know, say that it's done and, and check it off the list. So uh, the, if they're not sending email, then they need some kind of a proofing tool. And we'll just put alchemy proof in here for now because that's what we're going to show you. But whatever it is, right? It could be, a, there's lots of these proofing systems out there. Um, and we'll, we'll show you why this one's a little bit different. So now you have InDesign, something comes out of that. We put it in the proofing system. And, and now you've got yourself something that's a little bit better than emails, right? It, it gives you one place to review and collaborate. Uh, the designer goes there, maybe legal goes there, maybe, uh, marketing people go there. Well, here, here's all the, uh, the people. So you got brand standard people who are the sort of corporate. You've got the legal and compliance departments, marketing, the people that are responsible for the product, the look and feel, and how it operates, whatever. Uh, production standards need to be met here. So it might be production people looking at it at this design stage to make sure that, that you don't get all the way to production and then find out, wait a minute, the design is not right. You've got to go redesign it. And now we've missed our production deadline. So um, having this proofing system there serves a variety of different types of users and uh, gives them that, that one place to go. The history and versions are in here. So as things change and the people make the changes, they make the recommendations and the requests, that history is, can be recorded so that you have uh, an event log. You know, who's doing what, when are they requesting it, uh, who approved it, and that's good for, for evidence. So this tracking and evidence part, because a lot of times uh, if you're doing work for a customer and they approved it and you went to production and it wasn't right, you know, somebody's gonna get blamed and, and you might have a record of this in here that says, uh, you know, the customer approved it. And, um, we, we, you know, it's unfortunate for everybody, but at least you would have some evidence there. Same thing with like sending a compliance, highly regulated content where you may need to to show you may get audited at some point, or um, you know, there's other reasons maybe for, for court appearances or something, you might want some evidence. And so having that central proving system uh, with a database and a storage repository that can store things for long periods of time can be important for that. And then uh, security, there's a lot of things that are created that you don't want a lot of people to see. And so uh, whether it's a, a top secret formula for uh, Coca-Cola, or you know, a document that has variable data on it that's personally identifiable. Maybe we're gonna be proofing a job at some point or something, but um, you, know, you may have things that you're creating that you want only certain people to see and email doesn't cut it for security, then you know, proofing system uh, could solve that. And I got a little bit of overlap here between the two, the, the design system, let's say, uh, in design in this case, and the proofing tool because uh, when you store and organize content, uh, you're gonna store some stuff in InDesign because that's where the designer is working. And you're gonna store other things in the proofing system. Usually it's the output. So it wouldn't be the source files. It'd be like a PDF or a JPEG or you know, whatever it is. And it would go into the proofing system. So, so that has a responsibility in the workflow of, of maintaining that content. And um, so there'll be some storage in that as well. So just showing that there's some overlap between the two. 
Again, this editing could be proofing, we call it proof, but some people call it reviewing. So if, if in your industry, you call it a, a review process, then uh, the same thing applies here. All of these things would probably be uh, appropriate. Okay, so that's the, the design part of the discussion where we're getting something to the point where it's ready to be uh, created in large quantities. So if, you, if you're designing something that does get pushed to physical production or is an email or uh, maybe web pages where people are, you know, thousands of people are going to come look at it, then uh, there, there may be some additional processing that needs to be done. And so uh, when we move into that area, then how do you make sure that the proof that was approved is the one that's used over here? And so that, that workflow tends to be uh, centered around this spot. So you have maybe orders coming in. So there, there's some kind of design. We use the postcard that Lois and Mark showed earlier. Uh, it comes in and, and they're ready to do a print and mail job and they're gonna do them every month. So they've decided that this month we're gonna mail a thousand, next month we're gonna mail a thousand. We're just gonna do it out of that cadence so that we could uh, spread out the, the campaign. And so as uh, the, the orders or the jobs come in, the data comes in to be placed on that postcard, there's gonna be a processing system that does it. Take the variable data, maybe do some postal processing with it, and then get it cleaned up, get it ready to put on the postcards. And now we end up with a thousand postcards and each one is personalized. And uh, they may wanna proof that before it goes to the printer. So the last minute before we put ink on paper, we want to make sure that it's proper, that it's right, that the version we approved over here on the left is the version we're using in production. And that the data is good and you know other things you may want to check that, uh, that weren't on the shell, the static shell at, um, at that time. So uh, the proofing tends to take place right about there. And on the digital side, uh, usually right about here where you're going to have you know, orders coming in for various things and uh, the, the content before it gets distributed, you're going to be you know, checking it out right, before it goes to some sort of distribution or gets posted on the web or whatever. So uh, what we've done with the proofing system is we've linked these together so that uh, there's not only this one place and all these benefits for the digital you know, uh, preparation of the piece, but also any kind of automation and manufacturing. Uh, by the way, you could link, let me just zoom in a little bit. Um, you, you may want to link the proofing to your, uh, some people call this like an ADF if you're in transaction processing, uh, but it could be anything, whatever you have for your automation where files or orders come in and without having to have people push buttons, you know, you have some, some programs here that um, create this, this output. And then at the time of the output uh, for proofing, the, the processing system can talk to the proofing system, send it you know, what needs to be approved. And then the proofing system goes and lets everybody know, hey, uh, you're a reviewer and uh, the proof is ready for you. Please approve it or give feedback by noon tomorrow. And so they would get an email. So that's one of the benefits of these kinds of tools is the automated communications that shortens the time to get approval and uh, keeps the people who are creating the content from having to chase people down. So you can link these two. A lot of times it's either through our uh, API or through, uh, you could use just an SFTP and um, you know that would trigger the proofing system to pick it up. Uh, the proofing system I'm gonna show you sits in the cloud. And so the processing system could uh, plop a file in an FTP site, the system, the proofing system recognizes it, it knows what customer it's for, who the reviewers are, and it sends the notifications and then they can log in and, and approve it. Once they approve it, it updates the processing system. It says, hey, this has been approved, continue on with the rest of the, the workflow. And that can be done in, uh, usually through the, these handshaking or, or an XML standard that could be provided as well. Okay, so that's, um, that's kind of what that looks like. And it, it um, addresses a lot of uh, you know, various issues, but let me, uh, let me show it to you. The tool that we created is actually part of the Alchemy cloud suite of products. So we, we put a variety of things in the cloud. One of the reasons for this is that it um, shortens the time to deploy. We're very intentional with this proofing tool. There's lots of them out there. And uh, in our research, we looked at probably 50 of them. 
and uh, picked the best features of, of all of those, um, but kept it really simple. So uh, the, the whole point of this is that you could get into proofing literally in 30 minutes. You could set you up with an account and um, you, you would be an expert with it very quickly. Um, you'll see why. So let me move this out of the way so I can. Okay, so I'm gonna log in. And uh, once you have an account set up, which takes about five minutes, then you'll log in. Now, as a designer, you'll see it one way. And as a reviewer, you'll see it as another. So I'll try to point that out here as we go along. Uh, so I've logged in as a designer. And the first thing I see is, you know, some of the most immediate jobs that I've been working on. So I have a quick hit here. If it's something that I, you know, these are the hot ones or things that I, I worked on in yesterday, today, whatever, then, then they would show up here. You can also view these things in a little different format. I like to use this one because it shows me um, a file-based view and I can look at all of, you know, more than just those on the summary page. And I can see uh, immediately what's going on with all of my proofs as a designer. So I can see this one was uh, received, you know, into the system of this date. There's the due date on it that I put on there for somebody to review it. And um, here's the reviewer. In fact, I signed that one to myself. Uh, here we have something else. This one has three reviewers, Maria, myself, and Manina. And I can see also uh, the status of the proof. So it was created. That means it was uploaded into the system. It was sent out to the reviewers. Um, they opened it but they haven't completed the approval process yet. So I get a quick view on all my, my work and where it stands with the various people that need to review. Uh, from here, I can also do things like, well, let's look at the, uh, the books flyer. So I, I can look at this and uh, as a reviewer or the designer, I might get this view. I can comment on it. So you see these tools up here. I can, you know, I can add a comment to this section over here and, you know, uh, seems a little light, or, you know, whatever I wanna say. And uh, I can comment on the piece. When I do that, then, um, you know, it posts that comment and it also allows me to uh, at somebody and set a comment for the designer. So any kind of comments that come up here that I post could immediately be emailed to the designer to say, hey, Matt just commented on that piece. So we're creating these touch points from activity inside the proofing tool that are automatically triggered so people don't have to do it. So if, you know, typically if I'm modifying a PDF, then I'm either gonna attach it back to an email and send it, or I'm gonna send somebody the email and say, hey, make these particular changes. Um, here it's just automatic. As I start to comment, the notifications go to the designer. Uh, multiple pages, so I want to look at the back sides or whatever, you know, they, they would all show up here on the screen. There's also this uh, version control um, that, that can be managed within the system. Let me see if this one has any versions. This one doesn't, but I'll show you another one. Um, there's rulers and, you know, various things that, that people can use as well just to, to check the accuracy of the, the document or the content that's being designed. Okay, uh, another thing, let me see, there, there's uh, mailings, I'll show you that. So you can actually look at records. There's a database in this proofing tool. So if you're doing production proofing, you could see an actual mailing with all of the records. And let me show you that now. So here we have the mailing itself. If I wanna view the records, I can look at them on a screen like this. Uh, sometimes there's workflows where you wanna reject individual pieces. So not just accept or reject the job, but accept or reject individual documents or pieces within the job. And you can do that here. So I can reject all approve all, or I can you know, select some, and now I can reject the selected pieces. So for mailers, this is an important feature. Um, that data is in the database, and that's what you saw on that previous screen, but we also have the documents themselves. All of these would be maintained uh, in the system and you can store them for, for the evidence if you want long-term storage there. This one might have a comparison of each uh, versions. No, let me go find one of the desk. Uh, this one here does for sure. Uh, by the way, on the right-hand side, you also have a panel. So there's different ways to get to the data. So here I see that it was received, the due date, it was created by me. 
Uh, the PDF version histories are here. So this one definitely has two versions. I'll go look at those in a minute. The event history, this is really important. All the things that people do within the system are recorded here. So uh, it's basically been me on this one. If we look at some other ones, you'll see all the, the different people that logged in, that reviewed it, that commented. You'll see those activities here. If they approved it, you'll have a, a log entry here that they approved it. If they rejected, you'd see a log entry for rejection. So all that's maintained here in the system. So let's look at this one for the version compare. There's a nice little feature here that allows you to quickly compare without having to use your eyeballs. So let me set that down. All right, okay. And uh, let's go to the old version. So there's version zero. I'm looking at version one right now. So let's bring up version zero. Uh, so far they look kind of the same. So a little bit hard to find the change. So if I do an auto compare, then it will do a, basically a light table test, a byte for byte comparison. Uh, uh, actually, I shouldn't say byte for byte, pixel for pixel comparison of the two documents. And then it found that there's an email on the new version, there's not on the old, and the date has changed. So the, the variable content can be compared as well as the static content, and, and you would see those differences. So it's a nice tool to uh, quickly compare and find things that, that would be different. If you tried to eyeball this, uh, you could miss it. There's a lot of stuff on this document and there's other documents that I'm sure you deal with and things that are even more complicated than this. It'd be really hard to, to find differences just by looking at it. Okay, uh, the way to get stuff in here is either through these buttons manually or through the automation that I talked about earlier with the API and the, uh, the SFTP. If you did an SFTP, then you probably would create a project and that's an area where you have sort of recurring work and automation, maybe the same set of reviewers all the time, uh, a due date that is, you know, days from upload. So it's always three days from the date of upload. So, you know, you can create this automation in the system with a project, or you can do a, you know, just, just a quick proof by uploading, you know, through the, the quick proof. So if I go here and I say upload a file with quick proof, then uh, I'll just upload the same flyer that I showed you earlier. And uh, voila, we've got uh, the book flyer in here again. And so I, I've uploaded it twice. If I recognize, you know, I didn't mean to do that twice, I could delete it, uh, but here it is. And so instantaneously, I've got a proof, I can assign some reviewers. So I just put in, you know, if it's somebody who's already in the system, I can select them as a reviewer and they would get an email that says, hey, you're, you've been assigned to review this document or this piece. Okay, now once you have that content in there, then um, that version control I showed you before allows you to do this thing where you're, you're going back and forth between a production proof and the design proof, because a lot of times you wanna compare those things, you know, make sure, am I using the most recent, recent version in production of the proof that was approved on the left-hand side. And so within the tool, it has that capability. I showed you to do that, that side by side to make sure that uh, the most current version uh, of the design is being used. Okay, so uh, there, there's a lot more to show you, but for this webinar, I think that that's probably sufficient just to give you a taste for that, that proofing tool. Uh, the, the benefits here really are that, you know, proofing suffers from human communication. And especially now there's more content being created than ever in human history. And so uh, by automating the communications between a designer and the people who want to approve that content through the email automation and the, the adding of people, and, and there's other places inside the tool I didn't show you where you can have messaging uh, within the tool. So you can real time collaborate with, uh, with people then um, you know, that helps knock down the, the problems of human communication, especially if you compare it to email. Uh, email is decentralized. So when uh, you look at a tool like this, what you're looking at, uh, let me get here. What you're looking at is a central place. All of the assets are here. Everybody goes to this one place. The recorded history is here. The evidence is here. The control is here. Uh, you know, it's all here in one spot. 
And, and that's really different than doing something like, uh, like an email, which is decentralized. Uh, you have the benefit of uh, technology. So we showed the blue line. A blue line was a piece of technology. So <laughs> they would use a grease pencil and mark up those blue lines and, and hand them around physically, you know, hand to hand. Uh, now with PDF and, and uh, the digital tools we have available to us, there's, uh, you know, a benefit in this workflow. Proofing, the reason for proofing hasn't changed. It's just the way that we do it and the enormous amount of content that we have to deal with now uh, where technology really helps. And so centralization, automation, and democratizing all of this content is the message here that technology, this kind of technology can help you do that. All right, so that's, um, that's the presentation for now. I think we'll bring back uh, Lois and Mark. And if anybody has posted questions in the chat, we can, we can take those. Uh, Lois, Mark, any comments about this? Anything I missed that would be important well, to communicate? Yeah, Matt, um, I, you know, when I was looking at this, we work a lot with service providers, right? So our clients, we have in-plant clients, right? And this kind of makes sense from an in-plant point of view. But let's say somebody is using an external designer and an external printer. Does everybody have to get set up on the same account? I mean, how does, how does that work when you're sharing outside the four walls? Yeah, that's a great uh, point there. So inside of the system, then uh, let me find that right screen. You have, uh, as I added a reviewer here, uh -huh. you, um, you can have people inside your company and outside your company that can be reviewers. So as we set people up, you know, if you're a graphic designer and you need to get people um, lined up with this particular proof, you're gonna put their email address in here and they'll be added to the tables and then they will be part of the email group or the single reviewer. So uh, from a system perspective, it can keep track of that. Now, um, you can also have people who don't have authorization. Like maybe I want to send you this because, hey, Mark, I just want you to see what we're doing, but mm -hmm. you, have no, you have no authority to change it, right? So I can send you a link where you can come in and look at it, but you can't comment on it. You can't do anything. You just can look at it. So there's layers of security that go along with this that protect the content. And that way, if you have internal reviewers, external reviewers, you can control sort of what they do. Sure. So Matt, Matt can you elaborate a little more on the secu security and compliance? So it, when I was a, a product person uh, earlier in the, my years in financial services, it was always legal and compliance. And man, as a marketing person, we were typically at war with them in terms of what they would and wouldn't approve. Yeah, yeah. It's tougher with legal because legal likes to use um, text-based uh, documents, right? Like Microsoft Word, mm -hmm. uh, con contracts are in Word, or uh, legalese that goes on the backside of a, you know, an advertisement is is uh, in is just text, and so they like to do that. Um, you can do that uh, within here as well, so they can compare versions. Um, that's what legal likes to do too. Is what's different between this version and you know last month's version, or this contract and that contract. So uh, that side by side that I showed you could be used. Uh, right here, but instead of this, uh, whatever this is, some kind of a statement, it would be contracts. And they could do the hit the compare button and it would identify those differences in the contracts. So the tool set is applicable across different use cases. And how have your clients embraced um, having these types of tools in the cloud versus on-prem, which has sort of been the historical way people have used uh, collaboration tools? Yeah. we. Um, we feel like it's um, it's being well received because the uh, there, there's no management. It's not a project, right? To get this proofing system up and running, it's uh, managed in the cloud. It's in a secure, you know, uh, SOC two compliant environment, HIPAA compliant environment, and um, you don't have to have IT people accessing it and and maintaining it. And uh, I just showed you, you know, if you go here to the proofing website and um, you go to the, the proof page and you log in and you don't have an account. Uh, oh, I do, it logged me in automatically. But if you don't have an account, there's a button there that um, uh, says create your account. And so literally within five minutes, you can create your account and be off and running. So from that perspective, the cloud is, is nice because it's, uh, you know, it brings all those cloud benefits that come with any kind of a SaaS product. Great. 
Andrea, uh, any other questions? Did we get any questions on the chat? Yes, actually we do. Um, so here's one. Um, how are product and business teams changing their workflows to address compliance approval compliance approval of content? Yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, unless Mark, you could contribute to this too. My, my first thought is that um, the, the change over time. So where you had a hard copy piece, you could hand it to somebody that was pretty secure. Once we moved into the digital, where we start exchanging PDFs through email, then that's less secure and it can be problematic from a compliance perspective. So going back to a central, centralized proofing system instead of decentralized, um, then you know, that, that gives you the control, the security, the single place that can be monitored. And um, so, so from my perspective, it's the next step to take for security in digital proofing. So Matt, what we're seeing with some of our larger clients is the move to centralized content management. So there really is only one source, one record system that says, this is how our logo is, this is how message one is, message two, and then that central content management system is driving both documents, e-presentment, and digital content, be it email on the web or in an app. So we're, we're seeing clients make large migrations to centralized content management to streamline their workflow and to uh, eliminate the challenges with version control. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So uh, what you said is basically like this, although there's other legs in this and other products. So, you know, in design, if it could do everything, you wouldn't need a proofing system, right? But it doesn't have the capability. Its purpose in life is for designers to create content. Now there, there's some tools in it and, and other kinds of content creation systems that allow you to sort of, you know, create a proof and send it to somebody, but it's, it doesn't have a database and it's missing a lot of the things that you need for various types of proofing scenarios. Um, now, uh, this proofing tool also has some holes. There, there's other things that you might need um, to place in the environment to support uh, what you just described, where um, you, know, you, you may be adding uh, some kind of a system here that controls preference management and who gets the content and do they want it through email or do they want, want it in some other way? And, and so there's, you know, that you can plug in different tools to create the, the ecosystem that supports the, the proofing environment. The key to that is the interoperability between systems, right? You want something that's uh, maybe API driven or has uh, some other technique that allows you to, to plug these things together. The, the, the other, and it's just, you know, it's right below your bottom circle there is that tracking and evidence. Um, I was at a client this morning and it was the, the question that they were most concerned about was how do we know who approved this? Literally, that, that this is not made up. This is, you know, you didn't even know I was gonna say this because I didn't know the client was gonna bring it up this morning, but you know, it's a healthcare company and their question was, if this is a problem, how do we know who approved it? And so tracking has become, I think, even more important than it used to. Yep, agreed. So if you look at, I don't know, let me see if I can find one that's got some good tracking on it. Um, so here, this has, I think, some event history. So here's the version history uh, and, and the event history. So everything that's happened and any kind of approval would be logged here so that you can see you know, who approved the final piece. And you have all the version histories. This one had uh, several versions. This is a, an email that's uh, gonna be sent. All right, we do have uh, two more questions. So one is, how has proofing changed with digital content that can be different than printed documents? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, digital is so accessible, right? So um, that, that's the reason a centralized tool can work is because uh, you can put the digital content in here and if it's browser-based, then any, you know everybody, who has permissions can access it. And that's super valuable because um, in, in the offline world where you're handing it to somebody, it's, uh, it takes longer, right? You gotta, you gotta print maybe five copies and you gotta put them in a FedEx package and you send it out to everybody across the country or whatever. So the distance that you can reach and the, just the, the instant accessibility for everybody in digital is uh, one of the major differences I, I see. 
So Matt, what we're seeing is that there's a lot more content creators. As, as uh, there's a more collaboration amongst teams, there's actually more people creating different pieces of content. Content is changing more quickly, hence the move to some of these centralized content management systems. But more importantly, when people are approving, they're approving a slice. They're approving one segment. They're not approving whole documents anymore. Legal's just looking at this, marketing's looking at that, product people are looking at something else. So we're seeing in some ways, it's a little more complicated as you break content into individual objects and components. Nobody's holistically looking at all of it and sometimes until the very end. And the person doing that may not have the disciplines of all of the various approvals that may have gone before. Yep, that's a great point. Yep, so as people um, in the centralized tools, they can all look at that same piece and um, comment on their section of the components, you know. Yep. And then one more question, although I know you touched on this already, Matt, um, how is Alchemy Proof different from proving in Acrobat or in other Adobe creative apps? Yeah, I go back to the, the centralization thing. So if you're using InDesign, you uh, you're missing uh, you, you don't really have one place to go so the designer is going to export something from their content creation system and then send it to a reviewer uh, right that's typically how it's done or if the reviewer even has access to InDesign to you know maybe look at that which i think is a a small group of people that are out in the industry that that would allow a reviewer to log into InDesign and look at it. Um, th there's no history. There's uh, no database of record. Uh, there's just a lot of things missing. Um, can you can you do it? Yeah, you, you can create a proof and send it to somebody, but it really is uh, suffering from the lack of automated communication and um, you know the, the the tracking that goes along with it. Okay, perfect. We don't have any more questions. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. And remember that we will send you the webinar recording in a couple of days. Thank, thank you. you. So much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.